Bennett, um, when we're thinking about the institutions that are, are either assessing getting into this or, or in the early stage of, of, of thinking about it, tell us a little bit about you know, what people can expect. What should they be looking at? I mean, there's, there's a lot of similarities, but there, there's a lot of new risks that come with this space that, that maybe you know, traditional financial participants may not be familiar with. Kind of give yeah. us a, I know it's a, a it's deep a, topic and it could probably could, go on for a while. We could spend but. multiple panels talking <laughs> right. on this topic, but I'll try to keep it succinct and high level and it won't go into any like the very technical details of each nuanced area. But I think what I'll first start by saying is, you know, I'm not necessarily here to talk about the investment strategy side. I'll leave that to, to these two guys over here. But really looking at it from the perspective of an operational lens, I'm looking at it from a perspective of four different key areas. So the first thing that I like to talk to people about when it comes to investing in digital assets or in blockchain technologies, understanding some of the differences and the risks that are present within the custody approach to digital assets, right? So you know, generally speaking, depending upon the different strategies a fund may have, you have different types of custody arrangements they might require. And this is starting to change uh, very rapidly toward you know, a model where you can use a fully outsourced custodian that handles all of your crypto. But we're not quite there yet for all types of different fund strategies. So the first one is that you know, fully outsourced custodian where they handle the keys completely. Right? That's the more traditional model we're used to. The second level is more of this shared operational custodian model where basically with private keys, with managing custody of crypto, you can actually have multiple parties hold a piece of the key and you hold a piece of the key. And this helps in that they can help you operationalize and broadcast transactions and usually give you exposure to some of the more cutting edge tech if you're looking at more of the VC side of the investment in this space. Uh, and they also have a lot of built in technology level controls that businesses can use. And that third tier is kind of the self-custody layer, where if you're really working with some of the most cutting-edge companies in the digital asset space, you might be stuck dealing with. So it's important to understand kind of those three layers. And when we think about kind of what we would expect as auditors looking at an entity who's investing in digital assets to have covered from a control perspective, you know, this has only been further compounded by all the recent activities surrounding FTX, Celsius, Voyager, BlockFi, all, all the big names that we've heard about that kind of went down the last two years is, is really focused on four key control areas. This is really, you know, how do you get comfort over how the keys were generated and created? How do you get comfortable over the access management? You know, is there segregation of duties in place in terms of who can go and access these? Or is there one single founder that can actually just move everything if they just so choose, right? Uh, then you've got the physical and virtual security layer, more segregation of duties at that level. And then lastly, the incident response disaster recovery piece really important that companies test their ability to recover these funds. And when we look at this from a third party due diligence perspective, you know, this is also an important consideration to think about. If you are going to use, you know, a fully outsourced custodian, you should be reviewing their SOC 2, SOC 1 reports. Does it have coverage of <clears throat> the key management components? Um, also, you know, if we look at kind of the insurance perspective from a due diligence side, there's a lot of very specific ex exclusions that exist for crypto when we think about you know, ensuring custody of digital assets. So these are all really important things to keep in mind as you think about getting involved in this space. Understand how custody works or have a good CIO or CISO who understands this stuff well so you understand your risk and you can mitigate counterparty exposure. The only other thing I'd like to add to that before kind of moving on just to one other area around trading and accounting is you know, we are seeing a lot of the more fully outsourced custodians in this space uh, begin to offer what I just frankly call counterparty protection against exchange trading. You know, a lot of them have different names for it, but it's very simply what many of us are used to in the traditional finance world where, you know, historically you had to deposit digital assets on an exchange to trade with them. Now a lot of these large custodians are making collateral arrangements with the exchanges so that you can trade on the exchange platform with like for liquidity without ever leaving the secure bankruptcy remote custody environments of the fully outsourced, uh, outsourced custodians. So just moving on to the last two pieces, which I'd say is just kind of the trading considerations. I think the big thing to be aware of is just, you know, some of the more newer risks that are present in this space. We've seen a lot of these, uh, what we're calling forced API trade attacks, where, you know, basically API keys that are connected to exchanges or to OTCs that are being traded through are compromised. And, you know, non-liquid assets are being traded for that very highly liquid assets, resulting in some significant losses. So that's just one example of some of the more kind of nuanced risks that kind of exist in crypto. And then from the accounting side, you know, the most important thing when it comes to the accounting landscape of digital assets is, you know, do you have an accountant who understands crypto and is also a very good accountant who can apply 
existing guidance to this nascent and new cutting edge space. Right? I highly recommend checking out the AICPA's Auditing and Accounting Guide for Digital Assets. Also, just on the trading side, AMA has a very good paper on digital assets trading, you know, cybersecurity controls, and a number of other areas. And the last thing on the accounting side is just make sure you're getting good data and using good back office tools. You know, over the last few years, we've seen significant improvements in the back office side of digital asset accounting, you know, platforms such as Luca and a variety of others that are providing businesses with much better tooling to capture data surrounding digital assets because many of these exchanges or even the on-chain data uh, can get very complicated, even though it's as simple as you'd think, is just querying and grabbing the data, it can get a lot more complex. So, yeah, absolutely, Greg. I, I want to go over to you. Anything to add to that, but maybe from the founders or like like an investment, like VC perspective, like what should they be thinking about? Yeah, I think even taking a, a step back from the VC perspective, when you look at what Franklin Templeton did strategically, saying, okay, if we are going to be a leader in blockchain and we believe that this technology is going to become the back-end rails for the financial system. Uh, it's important that we understand this space entirely. And so what that means is, you know, a lot of today code is your counterparty risk as well as the company behind it. But in blockchain, smart contract code is your counterparty risk. And so specifically what Franklin Templeton did, they said, we're going to create a unit. That unit's going to report directly to the CEO akin on par to you know, our traditional bond and equity and macro funds. Um, as well as that, we're going to actually build in the space, so digital infrastructure. That means we've got a team of dedicated engineers that are out there building smart contract code, understanding the cryptography so that we don't fall victim to these um, end of address attacks that we're seeing, or if we can at least be aware of them to make sure that we can avoid them. Um, Two, making sure we run nodes as a service because that's a critical piece of the infrastructure, not only to support the ecosystem, but to understand what's actually going on on chain. Um, and all of this flows back to the investing side. So the venture team, we benefit from the engineers as well as the data, but we also, at, we also act as a leading edge detector of where these technologies are moving, uh, what the latest advances in the space are, and relay that back to engineers as well as infrastructure. And the token team does the same, right? And so obviously token um, to a certain degree is, is a new uh, capital asset, asset, however you want to frame it and value it, but it's something that needs to be respected and understood if you're going to be working with the SEC, if you're going to be trying to lead in the space to have things approved, like our money market fund that's on chain and uses no traditional backend rails, you need to understand what it means uh, to run a smart contract, to be, have a validator run transactions uh, that you control that are from your clients through their machines, um, and if you're going to allow it to interact freely, um, which we are currently not allowed to for regulatory reasons right now, but you know, is something that in the you know let's call medium term future is is an exciting thing that we certainly think is the technology is there it's it's a matter of institutions like franklin templeton working with regulatory um, bodies in order to get us there